thank you for joining the Atlantic Cyber Show. We're just going to yeah, do absolutely. this like a little little uh, a show. So uh, you used to work for Microsoft, and I've always been wondering, mm -hmm. did you ever have an argument with Bill Gates? <laughs> Um, I don't think, uh, I think you can have a disagreement and yeah. then you, you know, talk about the facts. I think that <laughs> was one of the what, great things about those discussions is you were the, very fact-based. And that, that, that's just sort of a, a moment of fear. I, I have um, always been intrigued, intrigued with uh, how a system evolved sort of the, in the digital world and Microsoft was so much part of that. Now we're kind of contending with this entire ecosystem that grew uh, from the operating systems of Microsoft and that were tied into so many elements of cyber, STEM, uh, bringing women into, the, into this uh, arena at a, at a higher degree of participation. And I, I guess I just want to ask you as someone who's been on all sides of this, how would you, what would you think are the biggest blind spots that the United States has today that it needs to fix to get its cyber health uh, into a better position? Well, first, from a policy and government standpoint, we're behind. We mm -hmm. tend to look backwards versus forwards. Right. And we look at technology, whether so what's it's- behind mean for- Behind means in policy. Right. One of the policies we've been working on this year, again, is the Email Privacy Act, um, a piece of legislation to make sure there's a warrant standard for information that's held in the cloud, like in old email, mm -hmm. just like um, you have with a piece of paper in your file drawer. Right. That's from a law written in 1986, long before anyone used email. We've just, people expect that there's a warrant standard on digital information, and we're still trying to update that law. It passed the House. We're trying to get it through the Senate. But I say that because here's a 1986 law that we're still trying to update to be current with the way the world works today. And we should be looking forward at where things are headed and being thoughtful about that, not just trying to you catch have up any from real hope ago. that that will happen? I mean, I just asked Senator Gardner about the digital literacy and level of, of, of um, competency of his colleagues, and he just paused and wouldn't answer. I mean, he just said, you know, it's Wednesday hip replacement day uh, in, in the Senate. But I mean, I'm, I'm sort of interested. These are highly consequential issues, hundreds of millions, if not, you know, billions of dollars involved in vulnerability, people's privacy. We've seen major hacks of, of uh, into information systems uh, on people. This one cry ransomware uh, incident that came in, and that's before you even get the base, sort of state-based malware into energy systems and energy grid. And as I said to him, every year it seems to be getting worse and worse and worse. So what wakes up your colleague? Um, one, I think we have to provide the education. Mm -hmm. um, I think people are using technology in every aspect of their lives today. And so whether or not people are deeply involved in the underlying interactions and, and issues of technology, they know the impact technology has. And I think we need to talk about it as infrastructure. We used mm -hmm. to talk about technology as kind of this nice to have. Now it's a must have. It's a basic piece of infra infrastructure. And we should talk about it as infrastructure and talk about keeping it up to date, just like the conversations we're having on how critically important is we keep our overall infrastructure up. Part of our task today is also look at the pipeline of talent of next generation or even current generation talent in dealing with this. And I know you've been active uh, in that as well. How, how would you, uh, what do you think the best and worst parts are of our kind of dealing with STEM, getting people into this field that we need? Because even in Washington state of all places, there's a skills gap, which is extraordinary to me because that is where Microsoft is. That's where is, you've got so many high tech firms and yet you're running at a deficit of talent. So one, education, education, education. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure our schools have all of the tools that they need so that students are getting a great education in sex, science, technology, engineering, math. But I also but say STEAM. Do you think the incentives are, are wrong? I mean, I hear that a well, lot, but what actually moves the needle? Well, do all of our rural communities have access to broadband in a way that those schools have the ability to um, have the same materials available? Not always true. Even right. in my district where, you know, we have a very strong technology region, you can go an hour and away and find schools that are in rural areas where they don't have nearly the same um, resources that are available. So we need to provide that because there are great minds in those rural areas that need that same education who might be able to help us solve big problems um, in technology that we have in the I future. I think that's sort of forgotten to. by people, right? I mean, I remember, you know, I don't remember, I wasn't this old, but when, when, you know, you see the old movies about Sputnik going up and that a lot of the missile innovation and the missile innovators were backyards folks in West Virginia and here and there, there doesn't seem to be as much appreciation for that today. Those areas are sort of forgotten, demeaned, looked 
looked at negatively, but you see talent out there. Well, because it, it's creativity, it's thinking outside the box. I mean, if you're living area, wherever you live, you have problems you have to solve, and you're trying to figure out how to solve them. And many times um, those experiences are from how people are growing up and the challenges that they face, and that can happen in any environment, any scenario. And so we have to look broad, but also I think no matter what your income or your zip code, you should have access to a great education. And we have to make sure that's true in across our country. And so when we look at the, the skills that we need for the jobs of today and tomorrow, it means putting that framework in place. And it, we shouldn't just talk about what it means for a young child growing up today. We also have to talk about workforce training and this the issue of lifelong learning. So when I was in college, you know, I was um, a biology major and we were programming in Pascal. Mm. Well, Pascal's not gonna probably serve me well today if I were looking for a computer science job, but most developers who might've learned, you know, COBOL, you know, of my era or Fortran or something like that, um, knew they had to continue to learn. And lifelong learning, I think, is going to be critically important as we talk about technology. You can't just say that you have a degree and then you're set. You need to continue to learn and to update your skills. And we need to talk about how we do that um, throughout someone's career, not just when they're in um, school or in, in, um, in college. I know that your travel schedule is insane. You know, there, I guess Alaska and Hawaii are probably the only two worst travel uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, gigs that that you would have, so you're back and forth. Do you get much time to actually socialize and hang out with your Republican colleagues? Um, we do on committees and um, occasionally when we're on trips where we have the opportunity to travel together. Right. So, um, so, talk, so what I'm interested in is, you know, if you were to imagine the overlaying circles of concern about cyber approaches, how, how much um, conformity, how much agreement is there between you and your Republican, because what you've laid out as sort of a progressive, smart, you can easily find, uh, you know, Democrats that way. We were to bring, you know, Cory Gardner up here, but I'm interested in how much opportunity there is for sort of a true national improvement and national strategy that works across the aisle. Well, I think technology is one of those areas where many of the issues aren't partisan. Right. So we have incredible opportunity. I helped um, co-found the Internet of Things Caucus with mm. Daryl Issa from California. And so he and I wanted to make sure we gave people an education and understanding of new technologies that were coming, these new sensors, connected devices, um, collectively the Internet of Things. Um, Congressman Eric Carlson and I started the Digital Trade Caucus to talk about issues of digital trade and cross-border data flows and um, data localization. Again, bipartisan. Right. Um, so. Um, we recently started a, a caucus for um, virtual and augmented reality to talk about the opportunities and issues there. Again, a bipartisan caucus. And so I do think there's tremendous mm. opportunity, but it's about educating and helping people understand the issues that we face. Um, but I think one of the and great opportunities And your co-chair of the Women's High Tech Caucus. Um, well. Susan Brooks. You do a lot of caucuses. Uh, how are <laughs> well, they going? Well, what you happens know, I in think a the opportunity we have in, yeah. in, with caucuses is there an opportunity, and you referred to this earlier, opportunity to educate people on issues. Right. So that's really what we see our role as to allow people to um, have a place to come. We can bring in speakers, show people technologies, what's there today, where things are headed, so that they're informed when they see these policy decisions come in front of them. And oh. that's. That's why these caucuses are important. How important or not has been the Russia hack, uh, I would say the big Russia hack of the election, but the Russia hacking not only in, in the presidential level, but in some of your colleagues' primaries and in other places in the election. Which story, I think that's actually, in, in many ways, more interesting are these side elections that there, there may have been Russian hacking. Has that, has that put everybody on edge? Well, I think it should definitely highlight to people the vulnerabilities that are out there, how important it is that people do everything they can to protect information. Um, we, you know, we talk about the simple things of people just changing passwords. I think sometimes people don't do the basics, and right. these issues really highlight how important it is that um, everybody takes some responsibility to make sure that you're doing everything possible to protect your information and um, and be smart about you know, emails that you receive mm -hmm. with links, et cetera. Um, this is, these are important. And many times um, these hacks, a lot of times it's kind of the entry 
is through a place where there was an easy access point, whether it's through a phishing attack or or um, someone um, not protecting information, um, maybe not changing their pa password very often. So it's important that people are vigilant and aware, and I do think that people are more aware. Have you read at all about this young guy, Marcus Hutchins? No. He, I mean, Marcus Hutchins is like the most important unknown guy in the world right now. He's this 22-year-old IT guy working in England for a Los Angeles uh, tech firm who, who found the one at Christ kill, kill switch. And, and if you go out and look at the media and take a quick look, they're basically saying that he came in and he basically saved the United States. Like that, that, that it, would have, it was reaching a level at which they're... And he found a vulnerability. People applauded him. But it sort of raises an interesting question of whether or not uh, the public policy world ought to somehow elevate this young British guy who sort of saved the world at some level. Uh, he seems so modest. Um, and, and I guess since you didn't know him, there isn't necessarily a move by the caucus to figure out how to create a congressional uh, <laughs> award. But I'm just wondering, if, you know, that, that it, this notion of somehow involving the public wherever the public may be and to solve some of these vulnerabilities is one of the new methodologies. The Pentagon has this program that it actually opened up and paid little cash rewards to people who found um, vulnerabilities or problems in, in the sort of Pentagon stuff. It was $150,000 and they found you know, a, a couple of hundred vulnerabilities they fixed. But do you see any opportunities yourself in drawing the broad public in as partners in, in dealing with some of these cyber vulnerabilities? Um, I, I think everybody has, uh, has realized that because technology is so pervasive, we also have the opportunity to make sure that um, everyone has the ability to provide information, to share information mm -hmm. in a, in, on vulnerabilities that they see. And I think many technology companies and others have tried to you know, let folks know, here's how to contact us, here's how to provide information, because you're absolutely right. It, someone may find a vulnerability. The person who finds it may not be a, you know, official expert who was right. challenged with find, finding it. It may be a, a young person who was um, hacking on something and found a vulnerability, and their ability to share that information and let folks know is very, very important. And so absolutely it should be something that the general public is involved in. I want to go to the audience in just a moment, but I guess the last thing um, I'm interested in is how you're looking at this question of you know, the, the, this mess that we're in right now that so many of us are distracted by, you know, potential collusion between you know, the White House, the Russians, or not, I shouldn't say, excuse me, campaign officials uh, and Russia on, in, in the cyber front, in some of the hacking and some of the disclosures that were made. What do you think from a, as, a, as an oversight, part of the oversight and the legislative branch that we ought to be um, expecting from the legislative branch that we're not seeing today in, in this world of news and concern? Well, I think you said it. We have a constitutional role to provide oversight, and um, and I think it's incredibly important that we do that job, mm -hmm. and we do that job in an unbiased fashion. And it's been disappointing to see kind of things slowly roll out and not necessarily the focus and independence um, on the congressional side to make sure that we really pursue an investigation. And an investigation is critically important mm -hmm. because – if, there's, if nothing happened, it's important that people know that. And if something happened, it's important that people know that. So um, I think the, the yesterday's news um, and the new role that um, Robert Mueller will be playing, I think, is very, very important. But I also think that Congress still has its oversight responsibility, and we need to make sure that our committees are doing um, their part to continue to, um, to investigate and play that role in a bipartisan Jason Chaffetz seems to be more active again, even though he's signaling he's coming out. Are you seeing more Republicans snap in uh, than, than we there before? I think it's yet to see. We've heard some folks talk about what they might be doing, but again, I think it's going to be important that this is a serious ongoing role of oversight and that, um, that it's bipartisan, that folks uh, make sure that they're reaching out to others and it's not just one or two people who are deciding whether or not uh, – a committee is moving forward. This needs to be an important let me Let me open the floor to Representative Del Bene. Yes, uh, right here in the back. We've got a microphone. Oops, did I blow it yeah. there? See, um, we'll go right back to you. I'm sorry. I ripped the mic from one, and my apologies. So 
So my question for you is, should the government or law enforcement get more involved in organizations that are not protecting their data, um, such as implementing fines for known security breaches that allow for hacks or cyber attacks of people's data? Um, this is a great question and actually something that we were We've been talking about, um, I used to serve on the Judiciary Committee, um, and this issue came up of how do you know when someone's doing everything possible to protect data and might still get hacked versus someone who's leaving the door wide open? And how does a court know, for example, if you're looking at a case for liability, where's that line? And the hard thing is, is that line isn't a stable line. It's constantly moving because new technologies are coming out, new threats might come out, um, be discovered. And so you need to constantly be staying up to date. And th that is an ongoing um, effort between folks who are working in technology, I think folks in the, in the public sector working together to understand. Um, I know that FTC has been working on this issue too. And, um, and so, again, you can't just say you have to meet X bar at one point in time. It's about being kind of what's that level that we can be clear of ongoing diligence and someone doing everything possible, knowing that even when you do everything possible, it's still, um, there still may be attack that's unexpected that could happen. Um, so that's something that been working on. Industry groups have been working on as well to make sure that they describe that, but there, there is an ongoing effort to try to provide some clarity there. Thank you. And let's go back to the person I how are you? My name is Yamari Sase. I am a junior journalism major from Hampton University and a reporting intern for Diverse Issues in Education. Um, my question for you is you mentioned a lot about education. What do you think are the best ways to encourage minorities or students from low-income families that lack the resources in their schools or areas and to understand and get involved in STEM? Terrific question. Thank you. It is a great question. And I think, um, one, as we were discussing, making sure we have resources so that students, wherever they live, um, have opportunities to um, have digital resources to be able to do things like an hour of code, um, to be able to be exposed to technology and technology opportunities. Um, we have students in a rural part of my district who um, ended up having the opportunity to partner with a school near close in Redmond, Washington, closer where Microsoft is. Um, and those students had the ability to share. Students from the school in Redmond um, actually helped provide more technology STEM training and coding training to students in more rural area. The question is, how do we create those partnerships to allow folks, whether they're in urban areas that are being underserved, in rural areas, to get opportunities to the same education that students might get who are in a more technology-based communities? But also, you know, mentorship and um, folks being able to um, show, and we've had this issue, whether it's um, with, uh, with communities of color or with women, um, part of it is when folks get involved in technology, sometimes they haven't seen career paths there. And so it's also about making sure that um, when folks do are able to move forward, we have that mentorship that's available, um, that we you know, look at the culture of organizations and make sure that they're open to providing opportunities and, um, and the needs. Because those actually um, make a huge difference in terms of being able to solve problems. If you think of technology as something that impacts everyone's life around the world, then um, you actually, having a diverse workforce actually means you probably are able to address mo most of those issues um, in a better way. And so that it's an important argument from providing opportunity. It's also probably an important economic and competitive argument that most businesses should be. Looking Thank at. you. Yes, right here. I'm going to bring a microphone to you. Hi, um, my name is Teresa Allison. I'm with the Carnegie Mellon Alumni Association. Um, my question is related to budgeting for IT security. What's happening for on what the, kind of security? Uh, for cybersecurity. For cybersecurity. Um, what's happening in relation to budgeting at the federal government level for IT security? Sometimes people um, systems are insecure be, or not secure because of um, behavioral, but sometimes it's a funding issue in balancing the risk between the funding. Great question. Thank um, you. So, and there's one important part of your question, which um, we haven't talked about yet, which is the fact that a lot of money has gone into implementing technology, especially in the public sector, and it hasn't always been well used, and we haven't always gotten the results that we've expected. And I think that has caused 
legislators at the federal, but also at the state and local level to be very concerned about spending money on technology because they've seen projects where a lot of money was spent and they got um, an implementation of something that was out of date by the time it got done, if it ever got done. And so we have to be very smart about how technology is used, realize that there are you know, products that, um, that can be implemented. Sometimes they're off the shelf products that are ready to go. Um, how do we make sure that the folks who are analyzing and trying to describe what's needed in a particular scenario are up to date on all the technologies that are available? Um, how do we make sure that we are using the latest technologies in government and are they being deployed? quickly and cost effectively. And so one of the things that we can continue to do is make sure we our best practices are shared, that when new technologies are deployed, that maybe we have more pilots where they're deployed and we see what works and what doesn't work, and that informs others so that um, you aren't making mistakes in multiple places, you're learning well. And I know that's worked very well also at the local level. Um, but we also have to realize that this is infrastructure too, and these aren't nice to have investments. These are important critical investments and keeping technology infrastructure up to date is critically, critically important. And we need to prioritize those investments to do that. So it's a combination of all of that. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, Representative Susan Del Bene. Thank, Thank you. you very, very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.